Um, um, thank you very much for joining us today. It's really good to see so many of you here um, for this webinar, which is part of our 5 and 25 series, um, which we are running every couple of months in 2022 uh, and indeed into 2023. Um, and we're going to be covering various topics throughout the life cycle of the procurement process. And today we're looking at frameworks and um, dynamic purchasing systems. So some quick introductions. I'm Jenny Ferris-Jones and I'm a professional support lawyer in the public procurement team here at Mills and Reeves. And I'm here today with my colleagues, Claire and Shaley, um, both of whom are principal associates and are also um, public procurement specialists here. Um, just before we get started, um, just the usual few points of housekeeping to cover. Um, first of all, technical issues. If anybody's having any difficulty hearing us or being able to see the slides or follow the slides, um, do just put a note in the Q&A box and my colleague Sarah um, will try to help you. Um, likewise, legal questions. Um, again, do um, feel free to put those in the Q&A box as well. We will pick those up and I think we will put, deal with those in a Q&A document that we will circulate after the session. Um, we won't have time to take questions directly in the session, but we will try to pick up as many of those as we can um, in our Q&A document. Um, also to mention that the session is being recorded and that we'll circulate a copy to uh, everybody afterwards together with a copy of the slides and the Q&A document. Um, but just to reassure you that only the panel speakers um, can be seen or heard on the recording. And finally, um, if the technology works, um, at the end of the webinar, you should, should see a short feedback form uh, uh, pop up at the end of the screen. If you could just take a couple of minutes to complete that, that would be really very much welcome. Um, we really value the feedback um, and it will help us to shape our, our future events. So I think that was all I was going to say on housekeeping, and I think we can make a start um, on turn to our first question, which I think Claire's going to pick up for us. And this is, how do we know which framework or dynamic purchasing system we should choose? So over to you, Claire, thank you. Thanks, Jenny. Good morning, everybody. Um, so this is one of the most commonly questions I certainly get asked as a procurement lawyer. Um, how do I know which framework or, or DPS to use for my requirement? Um, the first point is, unfortunately, at the moment, we don't have a central list or repository, much to the frustration, I think, of, of many clients. Um, I won't steal Jenny's thunder, but I think there is a plan in place to try and remedy that for the future. So it should be a little bit easier to try and identify which frameworks and dynamic purchasing systems are out there. Um, some of you may be familiar with the more commonly used frameworks. So, for example, Crown Commercial Services and NHS SBS. Um, quite helpfully, they list all of their framework agreements and dynamic purchasing systems on their website. So you can go in, take a look at what suppliers are on there, what the framework covers um, and it does cover quite a broad both of them cover quite a, a broad spectrum of services goods and works um, and also can be used by a, a, quite a wide range of contracting authorities and utilities too so there should be um, that's that's quite a good place to start so certainly CCS and NHS SBS um, another thing you could potentially do is if you have enough time um, consult your supplier market think about conducting some form of pre-market engagement possibly ask your suppliers what frameworks are you on what frameworks do you think might suit this requirement and again you can gather quite a lot of intelligence from that exercise um, the second thing to do is to look obviously at the, the subject matter of the framework and the particularly the lot if it's divided into lots are you looking at the right lot um, and check whether your requirements are appropriate for that particular framework or for that particular lot um, this should save a lot of pain <laughs> in, in the future where, for example, if you've selected the wrong framework, um, you then run a mini competition, you wait a requisite period of time for tenders to come in and you either get um, a nil response, a poor response or an in inadequate response. Um, so it's quite advisable really to do your homework and check that you are using the, the right framework and the right lot. A, a key clue might be what suppliers are on that framework and um, many of these frameworks 
framework agreements which are available publicly online also list the suppliers and again that can give you a flavour of whether you're looking at the right framework and looking at the right lot. Um, the next point we would probably alert um, procurement offices to are private sector frameworks. Um, the definition of a framework agreement within the public contracts regulations is an agreement between one or more contracting authorities and one or more economic operators. Therefore, if you are a contracting authority calling off from a framework, you're obliged by procurement law to, to, to follow the, the public contracts regulations and therefore um, query whether if you're calling from a framework agreement which is not operated by contracting authority, whether that's actually compliant um, with the regulations. So you, you probably need to check if you don't recognise the name of the supplier operating the framework or the, the, the organisation operating the framework rather, uh, check how they're constructed, are they sponsored by a public sector organization um, and that just makes sure that your call off will then be compliant. Um, finally, um, a good thing to interrogate are the co call off contract terms themselves. Um, are they acceptable? So they might be, it might be the right lot, it might be the right framework for your requirement, but actually the form of call off contracts you have to use with that framework, is that going to be acceptable? Will it be appealing to your supplier market? Um, a good example of this is perhaps G Cloud, where an authority has a right to terminate for convenience on 30 days notice um, and, and query whether is that something which may um, be perceived negatively by suppliers. So interrogating those, those particular call off terms is, is always quite a helpful um, exercise as it can, again, save a lot of pain um, down the line. Um, finally, um, one thing you might also want to consider if you think you've got the right, right framework, you think you've got the right lot, maybe the right call off terms, um, is the interest out there? Are you going to run a mini competition which generates sufficient interest? Um, and some frameworks do enable you to run a capability assessment or an expression of interest stage. And that just allows you to generate some intelligence in terms of the mark, potential market interest out there. And I'll come on to this in, in a later question, but also potentially narrow down the number of suppliers that you need to then invite to take part in the mini competition. I think that's all I'm, I, I had to say on question one. So I'll hand over to Shaley now to cover the second question. Thanks, Claire. Um, hi, everyone. So the question I'm going to tackle is, um, OK, so we've, we've done that analysis and we found uh, a framework or a DPS that we are uh, we think sort of fits our requirements. What issues do we need to be aware of before we before we get going? Um, so the first thing I wanted to talk about is whether the uh, framework or DPS is available to you as a contracting authority. Um, so the procurement rules are clear that uh, an authority has to be named in the framework agreement in order to use it. So when the framework or DPS is procured, uh, it must be clear to the bidders who are interested in, in winning a place on that framework, um, who it is that might call off from it. And that's so that they can get an understanding of the true scope of the um, and the value of the framework. So. Um, it's uh, so authorities must be named uh, uh, either sort of by name individually or by class. So, for example, you know, all local authorities in England, it is very easily defined. Um, and uh, you often see in contract notices uh, use of links to um, web pages with a list of authorities. Um, you may also. Um, you may also decide to include uh, a list of successor bodies or wholly owned companies of those authorities as well. So um, when you are looking at a framework to call off from, um, checking whether you um, meet any of those uh, criteria in terms of the, the list of authorities that may use the framework. If you're not named, then um, effectively there's a risk of legal challenge uh, based on uh, the failure to run a procurement when one was required. So you weren't that that framework was not available to you, and therefore you ought to have run um, a fresh competition for that requirement. Um, secondly, as uh, Claire's mentioned, uh, checking that the scope does um, 
that the scope is uh, of the framework, it does cover your entire requirement. Um, and as Claire mentioned, market engagement can can help to inform that and, and help you identify which framework to use. Um, I'll come on to talk a little a bit about changes later, but um, Regulation 72, uh, which is all about modifications to contracts, does apply to, um, to framework agreements and call-off contracts as well. And so um, amending the scope of a, a call-off contract can increase your risk of legal challenge. Um, it's also worth checking that the framework can cover your entire requirement um, depending on the subject matter of your uh, of your contract. Uh, the scope may have become obsolete so given that frameworks can last four years um, it might be that actually what it is you're looking for um, doesn't quite uh, fit the scope of the framework agreement. Um, and that brings me on to sort of my final point, which is around expiry of the framework agreement or DPS. Um, so it's fine for the call of contract to extend beyond the term of the framework agreement, um, but that's sort of within limits. Um, as an authority, you'll still need to make sure that the length of the call off contract is appropriate and reflects value for money considerations. So, um, it's not possible to award a long call off contract uh, just to avoid the, the need to procure it again um, uh, in, the, in the near future. And as part of that analysis, it's also um, useful to consider the usual pattern for call off contracts under that framework agreement. So um, a 12 month call off contract at the very end of a framework or DPS um, is likely to uh, raise suspicion when all other call off contracts have been uh, for a month. Um, so that's what I was going to say uh, on sort of issues to be aware of at the start. Um, I think Claire's now going to talk about call off methods. Thanks, Shaylee. So um, if you just move to the next slide, please, Jenny. Thank you. Um, so what are the usual approaches to calling off from a framework? Well, the first point perhaps to consider is um, your framework, the framework agreement itself will tell you how you have to call off from that framework. Um, and that might be, um, a, it might have an ability to be able to call off directly, which means you don't need to run a mini competition, or it might have a mini competition mechanism only where any call offs have to be, any and all call offs have to be conducted in accordance with a mini competition, or it could have a mixture of, of both of those um, call off procedures. Um, the one thing to be careful of where there is a direct award procedure is that um, you would need to follow the conditions set out within the ordering procedure to make sure you select the, prior, the, the supplier which is rightly entitled to that call off contract and that needs to be an objective and transparent mechanism. Um, in terms of mini competitions, um, I thought it might be helpful just to clear up a, a misconception, certainly I hear from time to time, is that under a dynamic purchasing system, um, you don't have the ability to directly award call off contracts. Um, so therefore, any um, call offs under a dynamic purchasing system need to be undertaken in accordance with a mini competition procedure. Um, the second um, point I wanted to cover when it comes to call offs is how do you know which suppliers you need to invite and the regulations state that you must invite all suppliers which are capable of fulfilling your requirements. Um, in some cases that might be very obvious, for example, the framework agreement might be split into individual lots, so you can see quite quickly that actually this, this only this particular lot is relevant to our requirement therefore we only need to invite the suppliers on this lot to participate in the mini competition. However in some frameworks it might not be as obvious or there might be other mechanisms which you can use to identify which suppliers are actually capable of performing your requirements. So I mentioned earlier um, for example NHS SBS frameworks have an ability for you to conduct a capability assessment prior to launching your, your mini competition. And again, the, the objective of that is to narrow down which suppliers are actually um, relevant to be invited into to the mini competition. Um, some framework agreements have a matrix 
box where you can select. Um, it's quite easy to identify which suppliers are relevant. It might be by geographical area. It might be by a particular capability. And again, um, as long as you're following the procedure which is laid down in that framework for selecting capable suppliers, um, that, that ensures your, your compliance with the regulations. Um, where it isn't clear at all, um, I guess the belt and braces approach is to invite all the suppliers. Um, you can't go wrong if you've asked everybody to, to participate in the mini competition, but obviously that um, means you're looking at more tenders potentially and it could lead to a more um, convoluted evaluation exercise. Um, another question we are often asked is, can we create a framework within a framework? So if we just move to the next slide. Thank you. Um, I think our opinion is generally no, that that isn't possible and could be problematic, although um, it's not specifically referenced in the public contracts regulations and that there's no specific case law that deals with this issue. Um, there are some some fundamental principles which obviously apply to procurement law and there are some um, parts of, of Regulation 33 which suggests it's not envisaged <laughs> that frameworks are, are awarded within frameworks. So, for example, Regulation 33.2 talks about the award of contracts under a framework, not framework agreements under a framework. So that is quite an important distinction when you look at the language used within the public contracts regulations. It, it's very careful in terms of mentioning framework agreements and contracts and recognising that they are separate concepts. Um, the second thing to think about, of course, is, is competition law issues. Um, frameworks are generally quite tightly regulated. They're seen as closing off a proportion of the market for quite a significant period of time. And, and that's why we have this, this four year rule, this four year cap when it comes to awarding framework agreements. Therefore, query, if you are looking at awarding a framework under a framework, what is the duration of that? Could that exceed the four year cap? Um, so again, it, it, there are some potential competition law and anti-competitive anti um, uh, considerations that you would need to take into account if you were looking to do this. Um, an area where I think it could be potentially more problematic is if you have a multi-supplier framework, um, which supplier is awarded the framework within the framework? Um, and of, again, you're, you're potentially cutting off quite a, a good proportion of business that would otherwise be available for the other suppliers on the framework. And um, the, the objective of a framework agreement is to, to, to basically compete or um, easily identify how call offs are awarded. If you've got a framework within a framework, you're potentially awarding a lot of work to a supplier without that, that call off mechanism being applied each time. Um, and finally, how do you articulate the scope? Um, it might be possible to articulate a very clear scope of what that framework within a framework will cover, um, but usually framework agreements are established because the, the scope isn't entirely clear from the outset and there might be different permutations of the work that, that come out under it. Um, so I think in summary, our view is um, awarding a framework agreement under a framework agreement is probably not compliant, probably could increase the, the practical risk of a procurement challenge, especially when it comes to, to multi-supplier framework agreements. So therefore, we would exercise quite a lot of caution um, if you were considering going down that route. Um, that was all I wanted to cover on question three. So I'll now pass back to Shaley for question four. Thank you. So um, what are some of the common mistakes made when using a framework or DPS? Um, the first one I wanted to talk about was um, potentially um, a bit of a misunderstanding over how long it might take to run a competition under a framework or a DPS. So I guess I'm really talking about DPS and mini competitions under framework agreements. Um, so depending on exactly what the call off mechanism looks like, um, there might be some time required to refine the mini competition terms. Um, there's the bid response time. So um, for framework agreements, there's no specified minimum time limit that you have to give bidders to return their uh, to return their um, 
mini tenders, um, but it's got to be proportionate to the requirements and that's explicitly set out in Regulation 33. Um, for dynamic purchasing systems, there's a minimum of 10 days um, unless you're a sub-central contracting authority, um, in which case you've got a little bit more flexibility to agree um, the minimum um, the, the, the deadline uh, and the maximum deadline of 15 days is mentioned in Regulation 34. Um, and then you've got the time it takes to evaluate um, responses as well um, and any sort of internal governance that you have to go through. Um, and you may also decide to run a uh, voluntary standstill period in order to reduce the risk of um, a complaint for contract ineffectiveness at the end of the procurement. So um, putting all that together, it starts to look like, um, you know, not a, not as speedy a process as you might have thought when you um, started out with the uh, using the framework agreement. So that's very useful to sort of factor in. Um, secondly, uh, one of the things we see quite often is a temptation to um, apply selection criteria when calling off, um, and that's something that ought to have been robustly checked when suppliers are bidding to get onto the framework. Um, and therefore, the anticipation is that um, criteria um, at the call off stage are forward facing and very much relevant to the precise call off. Um, it's also useful to check the terms of the framework agreement. So sometimes a supplier will have to regularly confirm compliance with the selection criteria, for example, sort of economic and financial standing. Um, Amendments to the award criteria and also amendments to the terms and conditions are, are generally um, not pro, uh, are generally not allowed and are prohibited under the terms of the framework. Um, you don't have to have the same award criteria as used to select the, the supply uh, to select the supplies to get onto the framework, um, and the framework agreement will likely set out the award criteria to be used. Um, so very useful to check the. Uh, framework terms and see how much flexibility there is in um, developing the award criteria. And the same goes for um, amendments to terms and conditions as well. I guess the, the risk of challenge there is that a supplier that's not on the framework um, says, well, um, had we known that the terms and conditions were going to be changed, um, we would have bid or our bid would have been different and that would have impacted on the decision to, um, to award the framework to, to the suppliers um, that made it on. Um, as I mentioned, Regulation 72 will apply to um, call off contracts. And I think we had a question about um, light touch services as well, and it will also apply to the light touch uh, regime too. Um, and the risk there is that if, if you can't get your amendment within the auspices of Regulation 72, then um, there's a risk of challenge that uh, the call off um, effectively creates a new contract that ought to have been competed. Um, I think we're planning a separate session on Regulation 72, so, so more to come on that in, in due course. Um, and finally, I just wanted to mention sort of publication requirements, and I've set out a guide on what is quite complicated um, on, the, on this slide. So um, the uh, publication requirements at the end of the process differ depending on whether you've got a framework or a DPS and also differ depending on whether you've got an above or below threshold contract. So um, I'll, leave, I'll leave that for, uh, for you to digest in your own time, but effectively, um, whilst you might not have to publish a contract award notice on find a tender service, there are other publication requirements on um, contracts finder um, and the need to maintain that audit trail for framework call off contracts um, and for contracts pursuant to DPS, you have got this ability to uh, publish contract award notices on a quarterly basis, um, which, which can, make, can make sort of administration of the DPS uh, just that little bit easier. On to Jenny next. Thanks, Sadie. I'll just move my slides on. Um, having a little bit of difficulty moving my slides on. Um, there we go. Yeah. So, yeah. So, what um, we thought we would finish up um, would be by talking to you just a little bit about how frameworks and DPSs are set to change going forward. Um, because as many of you will know, um, a wide ranging reform of procurement law is underway and we're expecting to see new regulations introduced um, later in 2023, 
Um, we may get a new bill on public procurement um, being introduced um, into Parliament in May of this year, so that would be something interesting to look out for. Although I think in terms of the detailed drafting of the new procurement regulations that we were going to be using, I think that would be sometime later in 2022. But having said that, we do know the high level of detail of what would be in the new legislation um, because the government has uh, outlined this for us um, in its response to its consultation on the Green Paper on uh, Transforming Public Procurement. And um, it's chapter five of that response that covers frameworks and DPSs. Uh, so we've got a good idea in sort of high level terms of what we can expect to see in the new legislation. So we thought we'd spend just a couple of minutes setting that out for you uh, as well. So first of all, the feature of the DPS is sort of currently, um, DPS is very much used just for um, simple requirements uh, and for commodities. Uh, and it's also not possible for the authority operating the DPS to charge contractors a fee for the privilege of using it. Um, I guess the sort of overall message going forward is that there's a proposal to turn DPSs into something that uh, would be called a dynamic market. Um, quite how it will work remains to be seen, and I think there would be um, uh, guidance issued on this, but the dynamic market would be suitable for a much wider range of goods and services. Um, although beyond that, it was still, broadly speaking, uh, work very much as, as, as DPSs currently do. So um, new suppliers who um, pass the selection criteria um, will be able to join the dynamic market at any point, but you will still need to publish a contract notice for each um, requirement. Um, if you're a utility, um, you'd be pleased to know you can continue to use um, qualification systems as currently. Um, a big difference will be that going forward, um, subject to certain limits, um, it will become possible to charge um, contractors uh, for, the, for the privilege of uh, being part of the dynamic market, uh, and that make, might make it um, more attractive uh, for authorities to set those up, um, along with the fact that um, it may be possible to use them for a wider range of goods and services. And then in terms of frameworks, um, we're going to see two types of frameworks going forward. Um, the closed frameworks, which are set out on the left of the screen here, would be very much as frameworks currently operate. So there would be a four year maximum term, uh, unless there are um, very exceptional circumstances that justify a longer term. And that's the same as is, as is currently the case. Um, and also, as is currently the case, once the, um, uh, the, the, the places on the framework have been awarded to suppliers, um, that framework is then closed to new entrants. You can't add um, new entrants to that framework agreement. So those kind of closed four-year frameworks are going to continue going forward. But then the new thing is that we're also going to have something which, which the um, response paper calls open frameworks. Um, these would be potentially up to eight years long, so twice as long. And uh, the really new thing is that after a certain um, initial period, um, it will be possible to have joining points, which opens those frameworks to new entrants. Um, so I think potentially these open frameworks um, could well combine the advantages of frameworks and DPSs. So as with frameworks, not too many tenders to evaluate. Um, but as with DPSs, um, an ability to adapt dynamically to the market um, by adding new suppliers at certain points. Um, if you're a utility, you'll, you'll be pleased to know that the current um, eight-year closed frameworks for utilities um, will, will continue under the new regime. Um, there'll be a continued ability to charge contractors a fee, um, again, subject to limits. And as I think um, Claire touched on in question one, um, there is a proposal to create a central register um, of all DPS and framework a bit, uh, opportunities that are available to just make it a little bit easier for um, uh, both suppliers and authorities to see what, what's out there. So I think it's right on 10.30, so I think that was all we um, had to uh, cover today. Um, Thank you all 
very much for for joining us. Um, just to remind that if you could pretend to possibly um, complete the feedback form, which will pop up when the webinar ends, we would um, we would be really grateful to to hear your feedback. Um, and so thank you very much to you all for attending. Um, hope you found it useful, and um, we hope to see you again at our next five and twenty five webinar very soon. Thank you, everyone.